Our next speaker today will be uh, T.K. Plant. Her presentation will be, she took the veil and covered herself. T.K. is a, a graduate of BYU in Ancient Near Eastern Studies. She is a, an independent researcher who lives in uh, Cedar Hills. Uh, she is currently uh, completing a book, Veiling the Mothers of Israel, a, journal, a Journey of Scholarship and Faith, of which um, this presentation today, she took the veil and covered herself, is a part of TK. Thank you, Dr. Ricks. Um, I just, I really want to thank you for all your help and this opportunity. And for his wife, Sister um, Dr. Shirley Ricks. I don't see her here today, but she's done a lot to help me. Um, and I want to take just a moment to thank my friends and family and uh, for for supporting me and being here. And I'm just really appreciative that they won't get up and leave once I start to talk. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so. Let's see, good morning. It is a pleasure to be here. And um, we're going to quickly go over this research. We're going to be flying at, at uh, an elevation of 35,000 feet and we're gonna be going at 500 miles an hour. So we're gonna go quickly. So to begin, let me make sure this is working here. There we go. Um, we're going to be looking at Genesis 24 and 38 where the recorded actions of Rebecca and Tamar taking the veil and covering themselves. My research attempts to understand the meaning of this, of the veil in the text and the reason why it's important to the narrative. I will begin my research with Rebecca and Tamar, uh, their account in the 1611 King James Version. Uh, the King James uh, scholars use the word a veil, V-A-I-L-E, uh, for Rebecca and Tamar's covering. I will briefly mention that it appears V-A-I-L-E and V-E-I-L have two separate etymologies, which may be significant uh, to the use of the King James scholars and support their understanding of the value of the covering to the narrative. And more information is in my paper. The Hebrew word saif has been translated as a veil uh, in the King James Version. However, translating it directly from the Masoretic text in both Rebecca and Tamar's narrative, the saif has a prefix denoting a definite article. This is significant, uh, this has significance to the veil's use in the narrative. Uh, it would, the use of a definite article is specific and makes donning the cloth significant to the narrative. It's like saying wear a coat versus wear the coat. The use of the definite article gives meaning to the clothing and the action in the narrative. Rebecca and Tamar didn't cover themselves with a veil. They covered themselves with the veil. Early Hebrew iconography is unavailable in the historical record. So to understand the actions of veiling and the meaning of the veil, I have used parallel methodology. The use, um, the use of this methodology is supported by uh, these leading scholars who I have highlighted in the slide. Just to quote Irene Winters, uh, the chair of the Department of History of Art and Architecture at Harvard University asserts, quote, I believe one can learn a great deal from parallel studies dealing with the archeologies span of monuments in other early states and from the role of imagery within related sociopolitical and cultural systems. There are three elements of parallel studies that will be reviewed. The first item uh, is the meaning of the term to cover. This has been found in ancient Near East texts as early as the third millennium BCE. 
The second item is the Assyrian law code dated 1550 BCE, which includes veiling as the contractual performance to endow societal rights, privileges, and authority to a wife. And the third element is a brief review and very brief of the iconography that demonstrates the veil's symbolism as a sacred covering for a goddess, a queen, or priestess. Historical finds provide support for the act of covering oneself with the veil as recorded in Genesis as the legal performance of a marriage, a culturally legitimate consummation, or perhaps betrothal. Betrothal, I'll get that word out. The phrase to cover has been found in Sumerian, Neo-Sumerian, and Hittite texts. The specific use of the term to cover is likely is likely an um, whoop, excuse me is likely an uh, an ancient Near Eastern idiom, meaning the accepted performance of a culturally recognized marriage. The Genesis account of Rebecca and Tamar's covering in the Saif or veil has similarities to early ancient Near Eastern veiling practices. Carol van der Toorn asserts that the symbolic gesture of covering came to be so intimately connected with the wedding ceremony that the term dual in uh, Akkadian Kedamu to cover developed the connotation to marry. Just briefly, this map uh, shows, and it's also included in the paper, approximate locations of historical areas um, and also it has references to the Genesis account of the patriarch's journeys. The Assyrian law code discovered in Ashur 1903 to 1914 by the German Oriental Society includes details and rights of the veiled woman. The code identifies the specific contractual and ceremonial actions that must occur to make a concubine a wife. The veil must be placed over the concubine and in front of witnesses, the husband then declares, she is my wife. These actions explicitly require the veil to be worn, witnessed, and contractual words to be spoken. If these actions do not occur, she is not a wife but remains a concubine. And I do have that information there on the slide, but it is also in, in the paper. The legal code uh, makes the veil a symbol of privilege for Assyrian women. The woman who accepts the terms and conditions of marriage has the authority to don the veil as validation of her position in society. The Assyrian law code records three specific rights of the veiled wife. One, the right of her children born in this relationship to receive an inheritance upon her husband's death. The number two, the right to receive support from the state upon the conditional loss of her husband. And number three is the right to, and this is really important, the right to inherit her husband's estate upon his death, even if she has no son. And it identifies in the law code specifically that her right to the estate supersedes the rights of the husband's brothers to the property. So you can see veiling is very significant. The code lists classes of women who have the right to veil. These classes of women are married, widowed, or a married eridul. Eridul is a Greek word used to identify an ancient cultic priestess who may be a ritual proxy for the fertility goddess who ensures the continuation of life for the society. The classes of women recorded in the law who do not have the authority to veil are listed as prostitutes, slaves, and unmarried eriduals. So this will be important when we look at Tamar's narrative. Uh, it's important to recognize that the code has 
no punishment for a married or widowed woman who does not veil. That's significant. Although harsh punishments are issued to the unlawful veil wearer. This supports the value of the veil in society to preserve the matriarchal order by protecting the unlawful use of the clothing. The Assyrian law code uh, identifies, and I'll just uh, summarize here, that's the code on the screen. Uh, it's also included in the paper. Uh, the Assyrian law code identifies harsh punishments to the unlawful veil wearer and to the man who does not report the imposter. So uh, this is pretty significant and harsh. There is a record of a forced devailing with similarities to the Assyrian law code in the Song of Solomon 5.7. And uh, again, that's in the paper. Uh, we won't go into it here. So we'll, we'll look at iconography. So the meaning of Rebecca and Tamar covering with the veil is enhanced with a parallel study of veiled iconography in the ancient Near East. There are observable symbolic similarities that may, uh, may be supported through the use of parallel methodology. Philippe Borgo states, Quote, as archaeologists have discovered underneath the appearance of Hellenized art, there flows profoundly and powerfully a current of Eastern inspiration. This is the epiphany of an Eastern goddess iconographically likened to the Hellenic mother of gods. End of quote. Um, although more research is needed, the later Hellenized style of iconography demonstrates significant parallels with earlier fertility goddesses from Mesopotamia. The use of the veil in ancient Near Eastern iconography supports the meaning, uh, supports its meaning as a symbol that venerates the sacred and deified power of life of the image. Comprehensive research about early veiled images is beyond the scope of this paper. However, I have included three slides just for um, uh, comparisons of cultures and eras. And I just need to qualify the benefits of the use of parallel methodology. This methodology provides a broad understanding of the veil symbolism in early Near Eastern cultures. However, it does not provide a deep analysis of veiling in each civilization or seek to understand the specific liturgical or cultural applications, styles, changes, or differences. With careful observations, a pattern across ancient societies of displaying the veil on fertility goddesses, queens, and married priestesses supports understanding of the veil as prized adornment. This is the earliest iconography I found in my research of a veiled image. This statuette is dated to 2500 BCE and depicts the goddess Ishtar as an enthroned deity with the power of life. This enthronement position is recognized by the image placed in a sitting position with her feet on a footstool. Ishtar images and narratives of her epic sacrificial descent to save her consort has been found in many ancient Near Eastern societies. She is very popular in the ancient world. She is the goddess who saves her consort and returns life to the earth every spring. Uh, in this image, her headdress is topped by a veil. Uh, there's lots of symbolism going on here. And uh, of course, more information is available in the paper. This second image, um, I would like to acknowledge um, uh, Sere Agaturk, who allowed me to use this, um, is dated 700 to 600 BCE. And it is a stylized polos, which is a tall cylinder headdress. And the relief includes a pitcher of water in her right hand, symbolizing her life force power. Water uh, symbolically represented the power of life. 
and in her left hand is a bird of prey, a symbol that acknowledges her sovereignty. And as you can see, the veil uh, tops her head and, and flows down to the full length of her robe. And this last image is dated much later. It's definitely a Hellenized funnery relief from Attica dated 350 BCE of a husband and a wife. Although this image is much later as noted by Burgo, there flows profoundly and powerfully a current of Eastern inspiration. The wife is sitting in an enthronement position with her feet on a footstool. A lion is beneath her chair um, as a symbol of her power and authority. Uh, and she is holding a large amphora, uh, a Grecian clay pot, as a symbol of her connection with the waters of life. The veil covers her nose and mouth as her husband stands in the attitude of veneration. So we just flew over that rather quickly. But now with that, we're going to move on to um, Rebecca and Tamar. So with that background, uh, we will look at Rebecca. Uh, and it's recorded that she said unto the servant, what man is this that walks in the field to meet us? And the servant said, it is my master. And then she took the veil and covered herself. So um, this Genesis account of Rebecca covering herself with the veil clarifies veiling is not an act of modesty. Since Rebecca had been traveling with the men in the caravan for several days and was not covered, it is precisely at the moment she sees Isaac that she covers herself with Atzaif, the veil. This recorded action likely verifies the marriage agreement witnessed by the men in the caravan. With similarities to the Assyrian Law Code and other ancient Near Eastern texts, their narration's inclusion of the statement covered herself may suggest the acceptance of the marriage agreement. As identified in the Assyrian Law Code, veiling is the legal action that protects Rebecca and her children born in this marriage agreement with rights and an inheritance. So based on ancient Near Eastern iconography, Rebecca's veiling as Isaac approaches may also acknowledge her role as the sacred source of life. The Old Testament account becomes the recorded recognition of Rebecca's accepted role as the sacred progenitor of her and Isaac's posterity. Rebecca is blessed by her brothers to be the mother of thousands of millions with power in her posterity over their enemies. If I may suggest, based on images of goddesses, the veiling of Rebecca before Isaac is the investiture honoring her legacy. Rebecca is veiled as the sacred mother of generations. Next, we will turn to Tamar. To understand what's going on in this narrative, um, I will need to summarize very briefly two ancient practices, one known as the Leverite Law, and the other is the Sacred Wedding Ceremony. The Leverite Law uh, becomes a way to care for the childless widow within the extended family clan and retain the tribe's land of inheritance. So um, in the Old Testament, the purpose of this proxy marriage code is to identify that the deceased husband's name be now put out of Israel. This law honors the deceased husband by, by raising up posterity in his name through his widow and the Leverite designated family proxy. And more information is found in the paper. The next is the cultic sacred wedding ceremony. Um, it's a scholarly term given to the cultic, cultic spring rites and wedding celebration of the ancient fertility goddess, worshipped in many ancient Near Eastern cultures. This seasonal ritual celebration 
was believed to return life to all living things. And this is recorded in the descent of Ishtar. Tamar is in Hebrew means palm tree or date palm. This is significant in the account as the palm tree is the, is the ancient symbol of the fertility goddess. Tamar's name would have had meaning to the ancient people as the fertility goddess during the cultic spring rites. In the cultic spring ritual, the fertility goddess's sacrificial rescue of her consort from the underworld is celebrated with a wedding ceremony, which, pe which people in the ancient world may have believed would have returned, uh, would return life to all living things. There is irony in this narrative of Tamar, who is named after the fertility goddess. She is left barren because of the wickedness of Judah's sons. As a, uh, as a result of the son's wickedness, they are slain by the Lord, leaving Tamar twice widowed and childless. As an obligation under the Leverite law, Judah is required to give his third son, Shelah, to Tamar as her husband. However, Judah disregards his obligation in fear that Shelah will die just as Judah's older sons had died. In addition, Judah abandons Tamar by sending her as a childless widow back to her father's house, which would have caused humiliation to Tamar and her family. The Tamar narrative includes a seasonal reference that sets the marriage events during the time of the spring sacred wedding ceremony. Judah, who is recently widowed, goes to shear his sheep. This is important. It's a detail in the narration um, that identifies the season as sheep are sheared in the spring. Tamar uses the cultic spring marriage practice to claim her legal rights under Leverite law. In Tamar's narrative, there are two Hebrew words translated as harlot in the King James Version. Um, these words may also be translated from Hebrew as temple cultic prostitute or temple priestess. As transliterated directly from the Masoretic te text, she poses as a zona and Kedesha. The Hebrew Zona is translated as harlot, but may also be a female cult prostitute, and perhaps an association with a lower class cultic priestess. The Hebrew Kedesha in direct translation is holy woman, which has a specific reference to a cultic priestess. This translation is also supported by the Assyrian law code, which specifically authorizes the veiling of a temple priestess who is married. Um, as attested by Chamberlain, Tamar's veil makes perfect ritual sense. Um, a man was to come to her not because she wore short skirts, heavy makeup, and he was lured by her particular individual beauty but because in her faceless, the sacred prostitute or uh, cultic priestess represented all women or the woman, and if I might add, the woman of life. Uh, union with her was, was not for personal gratification, but for the general welfare uh, for t and fertility of the land. As noted by Siebert, the Eridule was respected in the ancient society. And there's more information on that in, in the paper. Um, there is meaningful symbolism. Uh, if we understand the cultic wedding ceremony and uh, the veiling uh, laws, um, there's really meaningful symbolism going on in the narration of Tamar. She is veiled in the Saif as a holy woman at the entrance of Anaim. Anaim 
is the dual word form for the Hebrew word ein, which may be translated as pair of eyes or a double water spring. As water is, import, is an important inheritance with land and critical to the sustainability of a community, the city is the likely location of two springs or perhaps where a water spring separates into two. Tamar's sexual relations with Judah in the city of Anaim becomes a symbol of her blessing and adds meaning to the narrative as a double source of living water. In the narrative, Tamar, um, whose name is a symbol of the fertility goddess, has twice had her legal rights to posterity withheld by Judah's two sons. The town Anaim, likely named from a pair of nearby springs, is a city blessed with a double portion of living water. Tamar, as the veiled sacrificial fertility priestess, having been neglected by Judah and used by his two sons, finally receives full reparation through the Leverite proxy practice. She receives a double portion of life and conceives twin sons in the city named Double Spring. The early idiom to cover um, <clears throat> found in ancient Near East texts and the Assyrian law code and the ancient images of veiled goddesses, queens, and priestesses supports the Old Testament account of Rebecca and Tamar covering in Atzayif or the veil as significant to the narration or their, their narrative. The veil is likely the legal clothing that authenticates and endows their matriarchal authority with all of its rights and privileges. The, Rebecca, the record of Rebecca and Tamar covering themselves with the veil authorizes and venerates their position as the sacred life source for Israel. In conclusion, Rebecca and Tamar are memorialized in the Old Testament as the bearer of life, the mother of the family, the head of the tribe, the priestess, the ancestress, of the children of Israel and the royal tribe of Judah when they took the veil and covered themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, DK. This is her maiden voyage as a presenter <laughs> in an uh, academic setting. Thank you. She's she done good. <laughs> uh, the first question is this, does the veil have priestly origins or in some traditions, priestly authority or signaling and, and symbolize the veil of the temple? Uh, for example, when a woman veils herself in a priestly ritual between herself and her spouse as a symbol of entering deity's presence? Um, that's a, a good question. We do know from the um, Assyrian law code that um, married priestesses uh, were, mar uh, were veiled. Um, I do believe, um, and this is in my broader research, that there is symbolic association between the woman's veil and the veil of the temple. Um, let's see, and what was, was that, did that answer everything as a symbol? entering deity's presence. Yeah, it's, I don't know if, um, I don't know if it's the idea of entering deity's presence as much as it is an act of actually being deified. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, that's a good question and I don't know that specifically. 